missed you last week, but did you have a good vacation? All the guests want to hear anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I had such a nice vacation. And um, although California weather is nice, there's nothing that beats Kauai. So yeah. coming back jealous. from Kauai, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of Very hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're back and you're here on the live stream. So welcome, everyone. We will give everyone a few minutes to join as we always do. Please make sure if you guys, um, whoever you are, let us know who you are and where you're joining from. Please put that in the right hand comment pane. So today we are going to do a little bit of a different talk. So it's kind of an ask the experts, but it's more like Chris and I asking the experts. So we're going to be asking John a lot of questions and we'll talk a little bit about that. But as always, couple housekeeping. And um, please remember these live streams are not intended to replace therapy. If you're feeling unsafe or suicidal, if you're in the U.S., you can now call 988 instead of having to call the entire suicide prevention line. And of course, if you're outside of the U.S., please follow your local emergency services and um, phone numbers and information. Today, our goal is to really go through some important topics and to hopefully give some guidance and support about treatment. Um, as always, you guys can visit iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind to tell us what you want to hear, topics you want covered, and of course, to see our upcoming schedule for our live stream. Before we hop in, I want to say hi. Good to see you, David. Good to see you, Sydney. Um, everyone else, please let us know who you are and anything you want us to cover. But let's talk a little bit about the intention of today. So I'll share my thoughts. And then John and Chris, I'd love for you to share yours. Sorry, I'm not even introducing you, Dr. Bramowitz, but for those of you who don't know, um, John helps lead with Kyle King, our research roundtable once a month. And so many of you already know Dr. Bramowitz, but he is an incredible OCD clinician, has really led the way on inhibitory learning and so much um, research and treatment that we all use every day. So John, so good to see you. Happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. You're very kind. It is my honor and pleasure to be here with you guys. Well, we're excited, Chris. I'm not going to introduce you because uh, everyone knows you, and you know. I'm just happy to be back. It was weird to not be here for a couple Wednesdays in a row. I, I missed it. So, well, welcome back. Yeah, we missed you. So, I'm I'm happy you're here, and you're jumping right in. So, what is today about? So today, um, Jeff came up with some long title for us that that Chris and I were like, "What is that?" And so, really, the best way for us to describe it is our goal for today is whether you're an individual with OCD, a family member, or a clinician that we really understand how we choose and consider what treatment is best for us. Um, so one of the things we talked about is like teaching you how to be your best, the best consumer you can be for OCD or, or treatment, mental health treatment across the board. And um, so we'll talk a little bit about other diagnoses as well. We don't have to limit today to just OCD. Um, but really my goal, you know, one of the things I hear all the time is, how do I know if this provider is equipped to treat me, right? So like, how, how, how would I know that? And how do I choose the treatment to do? How do I know what to start with and where to start? And there's been a lot of conversations. And one of the things we noticed that we love, right? We love that the field is growing. We love that there's new education, hopefully new treatments, and hopefully treatment will continue to evolve, right? Nobody would want to still be doing treatment that we did 50 years ago. We hope that, you know, John, I think you actually have been on the forefront of, understanding inhibitory learning versus a traditional habituation model and the way it impacts treatment and our understanding of how to approach OCD. And so the goal is that treatment continues to evolve at the same time. How do we make sure, I always think about it like a fad diet, how do I make sure that I'm doing something that is going to have the best long-term results versus something that maybe seems exciting and might work um, in the interim or even quickly and how do we differentiate that? And how do we think about what makes sense and what doesn't? I love, Jacqueline, that you're, you're asking, do you think ERP is still the gold standard, right? That, um, that actually is exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what is, what isn't, and how do we come to those big statements of like, ERP is the gold standard, or this treatment makes sense or doesn't. It comes from rigor and science um, and things I don't understand very well, and John does. So we are going to break it down. But Chris, anything to add before we hop in today? Yeah, I mean, when I went and got treatment, you know, we didn't have as much understanding and education about why. And obviously becoming a provider, um, actually my thesis, I had to write a very large thesis, uh, quotes 
uh, many of John's uh, studies, in corp- including a lot of stuff on inhibitory learning. So, you know, I liked my program in grad school because it was very science based and research based and heavy in that. And it helped me learn as a as a clinician, but also a person with OCD. Like, how did we how did they come about the treatment that I did that was very effective for me? How did they decide that this was the medication that I should take? How did they decide the the pacing of the treatment and all that? So I was n- a kind of a blind consumer. Maybe we trusted really heavily on um, the IOCDF. And thank goodness, the IOCDF was a great place to start. And that's how I got care after a year of bad care. So what I'm hoping today does is for other people, they can have a little bit more education about how to come to that process of deciding what kind of care you're going to receive um, versus kind of us just trusting my mom and I trusting the IOCF blindly. So I'm hoping that people walk away from this and understand why, you know, the IOCF provides the specific information they do. And Chris, I want to hop in really quick just to say that, you know, I think I think it's important for us to acknowledge how lucky you probably were that you guys stumbled across IOCDF and that you were able to get to good treatment early on. We know, John, you could talk more about the stats, but like that isn't the case for most individuals, right? I mean, our latest study, I think, was average of 12 to 16 years from when someone starts having symptoms to getting appropriate treatment. And the reason that's that's why we're having this talk, right, is that every one of us on here Every person that's a part of IOCDF wants to lessen that gap, right? Our goal is that people get quicker access to effective treatment so they can get back to living their life, period. That's what all of us, I think, want and all of us would agree with. The question is, as a consumer, how can you play an active role that, that's the most helpful role in that process for yourself or your loved one um, versus sometimes feeling like you're getting thrown around and things that don't make sense. And then by the time you maybe get to good treatment, you're out of financials and um, you're frustrated with the system. You don't really believe in providers. And there's a lot of work we have to double work almost that we have to do. But John, what are some of your thoughts before we hop into today? Real quick, if I could just add one small thing, John, before you jump in from a personal touch, you know, my, my experience was that, Liz. I mean, I started showing signs when I was a little kid, like five. I didn't get evidence-based care until I was about 22. So, I mean, if you do the math, I fit in that category of like 17 years before getting care from first symptoms. And second, I didn't. we, we were so lucky we didn't stumble. We stumbled upon the IOCDF. The reason I'm so passionate about this organization is I was fresh off a suicide temp. I was a year, a year and a half of bad care. I was being told by providers who didn't do ERP. They couldn't help me. I wanted to... to to, to attempt again, I was done with life. And it wasn't until my mom was like, please, we found this organization, try this out. And it ended up working. So that's why it's so important to do this talk. Yeah, I think that we are, we're certainly getting better uh, over the past 20 or 30 years. More people know what OCD is, but not, not enough. So I think one of the challenges is just, you know, recognizing what that, that, that OCD is the is the problem a lot of even mental health providers trained mental health providers don't know how to recognize it or tell it apart you know from other problems and so that's that's one of the issues that that comes up and then it's it's just a dizzying array of types of you know therapies and interventions that are out there in the mental health field and not all of them are created equal and i know we're going to we're going to talk about some of the ones that um, do have mountains of evidence as being effective for, for OCD. So it's, it's knowing what to look for, and then not everyone's trained uh, in all of the, you know, the best practices for, for OCD or any one problem you know, that we could, we could talk about. And so it's how do we locate you know, those folks, and we can talk about the questions to ask, how do you make sure that you're with the, the right provider, the one that's most likely to help you? That's right. That's right. So let's start with, um, you know, we all have the goal in mind that by the end of today, people will feel confident in how they can make choices around treatment, right, for whatever they're struggling with. Um, So the first thing I want to start with is who should we go to for treatment? So um, forget what sort of treatment does the person do, um, but there has been an emergence of coaches for OCD treatment. And I shouldn't say that because it shouldn't be for OCD treatment, but where there are unlicensed unlicensed folks that have roles that may or may not make sense in treatment. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, and John, I'll ask you the question first, but how does someone know that someone has the proper license? So we're not even talking about training yet or doing treatment, but just like license and background to be treating a mental health condition. 
Yeah. So there are schools, there are training programs that train people in mental health, you know, um, uh, you know, pr professions. So we're talking about psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, licensed professional counselors. Um, and by the way, the degree is not as important as do they have a professional license? You know, that, that there's a licensing board, right? That controls the licenses that oversees that. And even more importantly for OCD, do they have the training specifically in how to work with folks with OCD? I'm a clinical psychologist, which is a very rigorous, you know, my training was seven years, um, you know, till I had my, my degree and then I did a postdoc. So it was eight before I had a license. And um, a lot of that was focused in on treating uh, OCD, but there are plenty of clinical psychologists who have, you know, lots and lots of training, but they, they don't know anything about OCD. They, right. they haven't been trained in that. So it's not necessarily the, the degree and there are people who have, um, yeah, so let's 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 talk about this right here, right? Yeah. So like I have my master's and PhD in social work, um, but all of my training is in OCD. Right. Chris, you have yeah, my my master's of science was in um, psychology and and counseling, and, and your so and your license is is so in California we have marriage family therapy, and then we also have professional clinical counselors. So those are like the two big ones, but we also have um, clinical social work. So. Those three. And then obviously, if somebody goes on and gets a PhD to be a psychologist right. well, as well. What's your license, Chris? Uh, I have both of those, the professional clinical counselor and um, my program, you could get both. So okay. marriage and family therapy. Yeah. yeah. So, right. So Chris would have two, two sets of letters behind his name. Mine would be more LCSW after PhD and John's would be PhD as a clinical psychologist. Right. And you can see that all three of us have different degrees um, si similar, but different training, but we are OCD specialists right. where there are plenty of people who have my degree, who have Chris's degree, who have John's degree, who don't have OCD training. Yeah. The letters after your name are, are important, but they're not as important as the specific training that the person gets. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, so and there, I mean, there are some people in our field who are, you know, outstanding and they have, um, they don't have P they don't, they're not called doctor. Right. And that's okay. As long as they've got the training. And they have a license. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have a license. Long, yeah. folks like John Hirschfeld and, and, you know, Chris, exactly. myself, lots of us that are yeah. licensed at the master's level, right. That it's not like, I think sometimes, and we hear this a lot at our clinic where they're like, I only want to see a doctor. I only, and it, and my response is like, well, actually, you want to see someone who specializes in OCD much right. more than seeing somebody with a certain degree. But let's talk about when individuals don't have degrees, um, but they're they're kind of treating or coaching. So, Chris, you and I have seen an emergence in this where um, a lot of advocates and individuals are doing some like OCD coaching and OCD support. Um, and there is great utility that we can talk about in a second for when coaching and support makes sense. And, and we might actually say, oh, yeah, that's encouraged and is recommended. But there's also times where I'd want us to be cautious. Um, and I want us to think about, you know, going back to, as Dr. Bramlitz was just saying, like, why is a license important versus not? Chris, if you had to explain that, like, why, if you were looking for your own clinician right now, would you be looking for someone who's licensed versus someone who has a lived experience and might be a, a life coach? Yeah, I, somebody that went through, you know, I, I think back to my program, and even if it wasn't OCD specific, because no real programs are OCD specific, it's the training we go on to do to get our hours is where we really learn OCD and, and what we kind of specialize in. But going back to, to master's program, I mean, you really learn how to assess, you learn how to do a treatment plan, you learn how to deal with crisis, you learn how to consult, and you learn a lot of the basics as a therapist that are super important to generally do therapy. So then when you go on to do your hours in a clinic, and you know, like I've you know, I earned my hours at where I work now. A lot of people earn their hours in an OCD specific clinic. And then what happens is you're able to take that OCD education and apply it to the specifics that you learned in graduate school. So I always think that the, the clinician is, is really there to kind of create that treatment plan, assess you and work you through. Now, somebody who's a coach typically is somebody that's gone through OCD themselves, have kind of figured out what worked for them, and then they're applying it. So what I always get cautious with people is it's kind of like someone who 
is gone through it themselves may have found things that work for them, but it's not necessarily going to work for everybody. Whereas what we learn in school and what was really implemented to us is to be flexible. Now the treatment is, 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 you know, is very like the way the treatment works is, is one way, but we always want to mold it to that specific client. So there are things that worked for me in my care that might've not worked for another client. So I need to know in general how to treat a client. And I really think that that's what you go through. Cause like John said, I mean, you go to education, then you have to do your hours and you have to take exam. Like there's a long process yeah. and it really helps you be in that kind of like forefront role to create a treatment plan for a client. When people have a license, what that means is that you can trust that they've received supervision in their training. They have supervised experience and lots of it. You need a certain number of hours before you can get a license. They have learned in many cases how to understand the literature and what's an effective treatment and what's not. So in many cases, they learn how to, how to uh, consume research. They've learned the proper ethics for mental health providers. They've learned, as you were mentioning, Chris, crisis management. They've learned how to do assessment and they have been uh, tested and gone through training and they've, they've been evaluated on that and they've passed those evaluations. They've taken a, an exam on, on all of that. And so that's why licensing boards exist because that way if someone's licensed, you can trust that they have, doesn't mean they're gonna always do a good job, uh, but you can trust that they've got the proper training. And here's the thing I want to I want to kind of jump into, and it's actually what we were going to go to next, but we're going to teeter between these two points for a second is why and how how many times um, I'm going to make an assumption here that John, Chris, that all of us still do uh, diagnostic evals on occasion. Um, and so or we supervise people who do oh, yeah. with that. Do y'all ever find when you're doing a diagnostic eval that someone comes to you for OCD that they don't have OCD? I find that all the time. And how how wrong would it be for you to treat it as OCD and to do some coaching or some give them some skills that you think make sense for OCD if, in fact, that's not what they're presenting with? Yeah, we don't want to try to put round pegs in square holes, or I don't know if I said that right. But if a person doesn't have OCD, for example, I often get referred folks. Um, I have, you know, I have OCD, my therapist tells me I have OCD or my family tells me I have OCD and we do an assessment and it turns out their obsessions are all about food and body image and things like that. And their compulsions are all about, you know, again, restricting their eating. So it's clear to me that they've got more of an eating disorder, a body, body image problem. And that's just something that I'm not trained in whatsoever. So if I tried, A, if I tried to apply what I know about OCD to helping that person, I'm, that is wrong for me to do. And if I said, well, I know a little bit about, you know, eating disorders, so I'll just go with what I know and I, I don't know very much, that's also terribly unethical. And I think the critical piece, though, is that what you are trained in, while you may not be an eating disorder specialist, all of us should be appropriately trained in assessment, right? So yes. it is our job as a clinician. And I will tell you, assessment isn't only session one. Right. Especially as someone who works at, like where my setting where it's an intensive program, we're doing assessments for weeks because as we're learning more about patients and seeing them and seeing them in the atmosphere, we're starting to say, you know, maybe this is OCD, but maybe this is something else going on or maybe this needs to be addressed differently. Or maybe there's some trauma that we're starting to really understand that impacts the way this individual sees the world and functions. And that has to be treated very different when there's checking behaviors that very much look like OCD, but they're actually trauma based. Right. And so I'm throwing this out there because, again, if Chris, you and I both live with OCD, right? Yeah. I think we'd be really good coaches. Um, if you asked me, we would, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. Right. But, but in I a, think you would be in a sense that we would feel... because you're not because you have OCD, but because you're trained in, in, you know, how to help folks with it. Right. And those two and, are not but I think thing. those are two different things, right? Yes. So I think yes. that 10 years ago, as somebody who lived with OCD, but I had not gone through school, sure. I could have given some OCD coaching based on my own experience, but I can promise you when I've seen presenting clients who actually it's PTSD, not OCD, and I find that out as I'm working with them, I wouldn't have known how to differentiate that. I can also promise you if I had a crisis situation, I wouldn't have necessarily known how to triage that because I wouldn't have had the. And so 
it, I want us to just think about what are the roles, right? So when you are getting an assessment, when you are then getting treatment, we want it to be done by a licensed individual, right? That's what makes sense. Now, with that being said, a lot of us do use coaches. Um, in a residential program, like I, I work at and run here in Houston, right? We use coaches all day long. We call them our residential counselors and our clinicians who are our licensed individuals help create our behavior plan for our patients. And our coaches then might help implement the behavior. And so you will see a lot of coaches that work under a licensed clinician in the field. And that's very different, right? Because they can help do in-person exposures. They can help do give that extra support that maybe your clinician doesn't have the time to, time to do. Yeah, an example, we kind of call them behavioral specialists in California, but a lot of times what people are looking for is if they don't really have the financial backing to take somebody to a residential or an intensive, they're seeing a, a, a you know, licensed clinician from a treatment center, or they're seeing somebody at the treatment center that, that that's master's or PhD level, but the client needs more care throughout the week. So they might find somebody who works at like a, a Rogers or works um, or is like a grad level, like in grad school. To, to work under that person to kind of help them at home. So might go to their home and help them with exposures. But I always think it's different because it's come from a plan. Going back to what you're saying about diagnosis, like one thing I really appreciated in college is learning the DSM, understanding other disorders, understanding differential di uh, disorders and things that could be comorbid because when working with a client now, they might present with some things that may look like OCD, but I'm like, no, that fits much more with OCPD or that fits more with generalized anxiety. And so I think that a coach that's kind of on their own, what they're going to struggle with is if they, if they're seeing something because subtypes are so different, they don't ne necessarily know all these other diagnoses. And so something may present different. So if, if somebody is working with a coach or if somebody is working with like a behavioral specialist, that person should be working under someone that's come up with a treatment plan that's in charge, that's led laying out the plan and that the client is still checking in with consistently right. to make sure it's going well, kind of what you were talking about at the center. That's at right. Houston. Love it. Yeah. So, so really important for us to think about number one, the first step is how do I find the right person, right? Thinking about, are they licensed? Um, and now let's talk a little bit about training and background, right? So the second step, like obviously once you get someone's, you, you need to get a proper diagnosis, right? So let's start there first. So when I get a diagnosis, let's pretend um, I, I get a diagnosis of OCD, we know that I'm going to look for OCD treatment. What happens if you get a dual diagnosis? So we'll talk in a little bit about how to look for OCD treatment and what that is. But if you are diagnosed with, let's say, OCD and PTSD, for example, um, we've done a webinar on this, but this will be a great place to start. What do I do? Like, what do I, what do I do with that, John? How would I navigate that? Yeah. So first it's important to say that for the majority of people with OCD, there are co-occurring um, other diagnoses, whether it's PT or there's another anxiety related problem like PTSD, depression is a big one, OCPD sometimes, substance use sometimes. Those are really the, the biggies. And they don't necessarily get in the way of, of treatment, but when you have an assessment, you wanna make sure that the clinician you're working with knows about these. And then you wanna discuss with that person, you know, do we jump right in and start working on OCD right now, even though I have depression, even though I have PTSD? Do we need to uh, manage these other problems first? Again, a well-trained clinician will be able to help you kind of, you know, sit with you and kind of ask the right questions to assess what's the, what's the order um, that we want to tackle things in. Can we do it? Do we do it all at once? Do we prioritize something over something else? Um, a well-trained clinician knows that, understands that. Uh, and can make sure that you're not jumping in too fast. And sometimes it's things we learn as we're working with a patient, right? So yes. when I when I first start working on the surface, if I see major contamination in the shower and we're talking about contamination rituals and you're identifying it as that, Chris, and we start working on it and we're treating it as OCD, but then it actually comes about that you've had a sexual trauma and that your cleaning rituals are actually around the trauma, not for OCD, I'm going to need to either be able to shift, right? And someone like myself who, you know, some training. Yes, I did my postdoc at the VA. So sure, I have some training in PTSD. I may say, okay, like I can do this work or I need to be working with a, a, someone, a provider who's doing just some CPT or PE separate. Those are the effective treatments for PTSD. We can talk about that later. Um, but right, like Chris, it would be important that I'm not still just treating that as OCD. 
right? Absolutely. Because if I'm just yeah. doing ear, not just, but if I'm doing ERP, we might see some of the symptoms might reduce, right? The, we might we might make a dent in the cleaning behaviors, but if we don't address the PTSD and what actually was why they were engaging in the cleaning behaviors because we were just treating it as OCD, that's also detrimental. Yeah, I mean, sometimes symptoms of ASD, like autism spectrum disorder, some of the things that individuals do may seem like OCD because it's very repetitive behaviors, but there's not like the terror and the fear and the, you know, the, the, the fright behind it. Um, you know, I, I think of my own care, it's like when I was in treatment, as we got about halfway through and I started being more open with my clinician and being honest about, hey, a lot of the reasons I do these rituals is because I hate the way I look and it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm cleaning all the time, not necessarily because I'm afraid of germs, but I'm afraid of touching my skin and my skin breaking out because I think I have horrific acne. Luckily, my clinician was like, that's body dysmorphic disorder. This is an OCD. She didn't feel specialized in it. So she referred me to someone and I was seeing both of those clinicians. But if I would have kept treating the BDD like OCD, there would have been a lot missing. And then sometimes like I was dealing with panic attacks and anxiety and depression, but a lot of that was from the OCD and BDD. So as the OCD and BDD was treated, I noticed that the anxiety went down. I noticed the depression went down. However, if somebody's extremely depressed because they're you know, mother just died, you know, that depression most likely isn't going to go away with the OCD treatment. So they may need to either work with a clinician who's trained in both or work with another clinician if that um, person doesn't feel equipped to work with with grief, um, bereavement, etc. So it's important for the clinician to kind of figure out where is all this coming from? And is it something we can do together? Do they need separate clinicians? Sometimes for, for people, the OCD is so immediate that that needs to be treated first before they can focus on other stuff. So it's really parsing that out and what works best overall for the client. That's right. And one of the things I love, I saw John kind of do like a bingo when you said it, Chris, is what is primary, right? So sometimes like for me, I definitely had depression. It was secondary to my OCD. So when the OCD was treated, my depression lifted and there was no, I no longer met criteria for depression when my OCD was well managed and treated. If that wasn't the case, we need to assess that, right? And treat that differently. But it's important for us to know. And as clinicians, as John's saying, and we're talking, we are, it should be our job to help continuously do assessments, right? Every session when we're, if we hear new things, if we're, we understand you, right, we're meeting you where you are to figure out what your current needs are to help move the needle um, in your outcomes. Absolutely. Yep. All right. So next question is how do you even think about choosing treatment? So let's say you, you, you go, you get an assessment and let's start with, um, let's actually start with comorbidities because then we'll dive into OCD more specifically and that's gonna be the bulk of today. Um, but let's say you are diagnosed with OCD and PTSD. How, well, then what? How do you make a decision around, hopefully your provider's well-versed and they can help walk you through it. But if they are or they are not, how would you make a decision to say, okay, well, what treatment is effective and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense for these two diagnoses? Well, we want to use as much as we can. We want to base our decisions on the research, right? On the studies that have been done. Uh, there are, and not all studies are created equal. We have studies that are very rigorous where they compare different types of treatments or treatments or, you know, uh, and control uh, participants and or control conditions. And we want to be as much as we can using that literature uh, or you want a clinician who's going to use that literature to inform treatment. So how do you do that as a patient? How do you do that? Right. Because you're not going to know, like before I did, went to school, scientific articles to me were reading Chinese, right? right. It's kind of like when my husband's <laughs> talking about engineering and I'm like, sounds good, whatever you say. Right. Um, right. How, how as a patient do you understand what, what treatment is proven and where, like, how, what do you do? How do you navigate that? Well, we have to take, other people's word for it. And similarly, not every word is created equal. You can go online and see all sorts of stuff. The IOCDF happens to be an extremely reputable, uh, better than any other organization um, out there uh, on providing the right type of information for consumers about what works, what doesn't work. We have, I've written, I've actually written an article, a couple of articles in the newsletter about what doesn't work for OCD and what to stay away from. And which is, I think, just as important as knowing what, what does work. Um, but we, we need to lean on, um, you know, organiz organizations and other advocacy groups that know what they're talking about. 
but again, Liz, I mean, this is where it's kind of scary because in the information age, you can dial up a website and find, you know, anybody talking about anything that, that works for, for OCD. If you look hard enough, um, that's one of the things that keeps me awake at night. Yeah. It's scary. You know, I always say this is that, um, you know, two things I always say, I'll, I'll, I'll go this back for a second about training is that if I had cancer, I would not want to know whether or not the person treating me has had cancer. I want to know if they are a trained oncologist who works at a center that is backed by the latest research and evidence um, for whatever I'm diagnosed with. Right. And so, you know, it's really, and I think unfortunately in the mental health field, we are not regulated the way we should be. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I always tell people, if you find someone's online profile and it says they treat 20 disorders, you should be weary. I was just going to say that. Right. That is my, like, people always say, well, Liz, how do I know? I two things, and we'll get to some of those in a little bit. But my first is, like, if we treat a million things, we, like, I cannot be a specialist. It's not possible. And we know, right, those of us that treat OCD, it's all we do. It consumes our day. It consumes our night. It consumes everything, right? And we don't get it right all the time. We don't, we don't um, have success with every patient and we spend so much time conceptualizing and trying to understand and try to, trying to better implement treatment that'll work for those patients that there's no way we could do it for a lot of different disorders and be good at it. Yeah. Um, now, I, I will say there are individuals that what they do for a living is assessments like neuropsych assessments or things like that. It's a little bit different, right? Their job is to be specialists in assessments where they're going to be diagnosing, but they're not going to be doing the treatment and they might be referring to treatment. And that's a great place and a great, you know, I often will refer a lot for neuropsych assessments when I'm not totally sure there's things we need to tease apart and, you know, we need to better understand. So a couple thoughts. Um, I always say, is there a reputable organization for the diagnosis you're living with. So for OCD, IOCD app, where your go-to source, we all feel confident, it's great, right? There's a scientific advisory board that oversees content that we can feel really good about. ADAA, right? The Anxiety Disorder Association of America, wonderful, reputable organization for any anxiety disorder. Um, I also recommend SAMHSA. So SAMHSA, you can go to it, S-A-M-H-S-A.gov, right? But this is really a government organization that sometimes SAMHSA for substance use and mental health will kind of publish research and data and information that you can, that, you know, is or has a bigger, has more oversight, I should say, and hopefully is backed by more evidence-based research. I've been on an OCD panel through SAMHSA. I think they really do a good job of trying to, to stay on top of it. But be weary of Google, be weary of YouTube, right? Because again, and y'all know this, um, if you have cancer and you live in Houston, even if you don't live in Houston, MD Anderson's your go-to source, right? It's, It's a phenomenal cancer clinic. It's, you know, one of the top, top ones in the country every year. Um, that is much more reputable than me texting my sister who's going to Google what to do about my cancer diagnosis and tell me what to do. Good intentions, but like we're going to you know, be totally lost and really have no idea. Um, so we want to be careful. I'll give you all a project we can all do. Um, my sister got so frustrated by this years ago that when we were doing peace of mind, <clears throat> that we would have so many individuals that just struggled with this, right? They got the wrong treatment. Um, People were sending them the wrong places. They were Googling and not knowing what to do that. She said, you know, we need to buy this website domain called askthedoctor.com. And we need to make it where you would put your diagnosis and then it would just automatically populate with the evidence-based treatment and research articles with it. And like, that wouldn't be that hard. I don't know why we can't do that, you know, cause think about how great it would be if we could just, and so I want to first just empathize with the frustration people feel of how hard it is to know and to navigate yeah. because we agree. And, and I wish it was easier because we can all say for OCD go here for this. Go- we really in today's world should be able to go to one place and feel like, okay, this is a, a good place backed by sound research that we know here's where to start and here's what makes the most sense and is going to have the best chance of success for my diagnosis. Yep. I want to highlight one thing about the IOCDF as well is I I think some people don't understand this, but we have OCD and then we have OCD related disorders. So the DSM I was talking about earlier, what that does is it has a list of all the different mental health conditions and OCD is its own category. Now there's a couple conditions included in that. So one is body dysmorphic disorder, one is hoarding disorder, one is skin picking, hair pulling. So 
um, those are found in there. And the IOCDF actually also has really, really good information for that. So they have their own hoarding website, their own BDD website and information on that. So when we go back to kind of that conversation about psychology today, somebody put in the chat of like all those different disorders. If you have a clinician that treats all of those, that's not too shocking. Like I treat OCD and BDD really specialize in those two. Um, I know like Kim Quinlan, for instance, uh, and, and uh, Karen Pickett really focus here in California on OCD and BFRBs, which is the skin picking hair pulling. So sometimes clinicians can do that. What totally. I get worry of is if somebody's a specialist in like EMDR for trauma, they treat OCD, they do hoarding, they do couples work, they do trauma, they do life coaching, they do uh, job search, they can treat, there's just, you know, it's like pretty soon, in like particular, how many different... hours do you have in the day? <laughs> yeah. And in yeah, particular, right. let's all think about the fact that mental health disorders tend to be categorized, right? So thought disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, sure, DSM, you know, change a little bit with OCD and anxiety disorders. But most of us who treat OCD can treat anxiety disorders and can yeah. treat depression because it's so comorbid. Some of us also have background in trauma, which is, you know, an anxiety disorder. Some of us have, but again, it's, that is very different than me saying I also treat bipolar or I also mm -hmm. treat schizophrenia, right? Because those are completely different. Like the treatment modalities and the approaches are completely different than a CBT approach, right? And CBT, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but like an umbrella of CBT, it treats a lot of disorders, right? So, um, I mean, I taught CBT at Baylor, right? And so I could teach the course, no problem. But even teaching CBT, and I can teach the basics of CBT for eating disorders or PTSD or OCD, I will tell you, I'm not a specialist. Even though I did a postdoc at the VA, I'm not a specialist in trauma, and I'm not a specialist in eating disorders. I can kind of lightly touch on it, and I can give you feedback if what you're doing is evidence-based or not, right? But it's not my specialty like OCD. Um, and so it's very different. So let, let's keep hopping in. So, John... I think you do such a beautiful job describing this. And I, I think that a lot of us, I actually remember when I was interviewing for my first job, the dean said to me, you know, Liz, I hear the word evidence-based care used all the time. I want you to describe what it actually means and what it means to you. And my definition of evidence-based care was not scientific, right? My, my way of describing it was as a patient who got a lot of treatment that never worked. I understand the impact and why evidence-based care saved and changed my life. Um, and to me, evidence-based care in a nutshell, right, in layman's terms, it's treatment that works, um, treatment that's known to work. That doesn't always mean it's going to be successful, right? That doesn't always mean it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the winning, you know, it's going to be the home run every time, but it certainly is going to give me the best chance at that. And so I, I would love for you to describe the science of how does something become labeled as evidence-based care and what does that actually mean and what, or what should it actually mean compared to sometimes what might be um, said as evidence-based. Absolutely. So let's start with there, there are different types of studies that can be done to look at the effects of a, of a treatment. The most simple is a case study where you have one person who goes through a treatment from beginning to end and we can see how, how that person does. And that can, that's interesting, that can tell us some hypotheses about what might work. But we, just from one person, we can't just generalize to everyone, let's say with, with OCD, because a treatment worked for one person, doesn't mean it's gonna work for everybody. There might be specific things about that, that one person that doesn't make it relevant to everybody. So then, the next type of study we can do is, a, is we have a group, a cohort study, where we have one group of folks that go through, like maybe 20 or 30 people that go through treatment from beginning to end, and then we can see how, how they do. And that's better than just having one person, except that when we only have one group, we can't really know how the treatment does relative to if the person didn't get any treatment at all, because there are other factors that could account for why someone and why a group of people might get better the passage of time, the fact that people seek out treatment when they're doing really badly, when they're at their worst. And so just by regression to the mean, some of them are likely to end up feeling better even if they didn't have any treatment at all. So these group, you know, single group studies are helpful, but again, not the be all end all. The, the rigorous kind of study that, that we use to determine what's an evidence-based treatment is called a randomized controlled trial. And this is a study where you have a large number, a large number of uh, people with OCD, for example, 
they are randomly assigned to receive either a treatment or some sort of a placebo uh, treatment. So they don't get to pick which treatment because when you pick which treatment that, you know, we know that people do better when they pick which treatment they want. So these are folks that are randomly assigned and then they receive treatment and then they're assessed at the post-test, post-treatment, and then they're assessed later on at, at follow-up. And I won't get into all the specifics, but because of the certain aspects of these kinds of studies, this is the only way to determine how well a specific treatment works better than receiving no treatment. Could you give an example of what, let's pretend Chris and I were in your study yeah. um, and you were studying ERP and one of us was getting ERP, one of us was getting, a, let's pretend Chris got randomized to the ERP side. Of course, he doesn't know, right. right? So he doesn't know he's getting ERP, but he knows he's getting treatment. And I am the placebo side. What might that look like? Would it be talk therapy? Like I would still be going to treatment, but not. Yeah. The placebo is typically a treatment that we know doesn't work like it or shouldn't work conceptually for OCD. So yeah, talk therapy. Well, you can't talk someone out of OCD. It just doesn't work like that. Or relaxation therapy. You can't do progressive muscle relaxation. Uh, sometimes folks are given a pill placebo. Sometimes folks are given, I, I, those are kind of the main, sure. you know, anxiety management training, right? Which is just kind of, you know, here's, you know, relax or, or go and exercise or stuff, which are good things generally, but they're not going to be effective treatments for OCD. So then and, what happens at the end? So well, how so do you test the, it? The nice thing about these control treatments is that that controls for the expectation of improvement because the people in the study, they don't know that we don't expect relaxation to work. They think, oh, I'm in a study. I should be getting better. And so at the end, we give them, you know, the Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale, which we give them at the beginning as well. And then we can make comparisons between the ERP group, the average score, and the control group, the average score. And what that tells us is that the difference equates to how much better is the ERP than the control treatment. By the way, many control treatments work. They don't work very well, hopefully, although in some studies they actually do sometimes because there is a placebo effect in, okay. in OCD. Um, but what we want to see is that the, the active treatment, the ERP, is doing you know, substantially better than the control. And that tells us ERP has a specific effect on OCD. So I want to talk about two things that I think are really important. So number one, um, can you talk a little bit about just like a power analysis and why wow. sample size is important? You don't yeah. have to talk about it, but just like- We're getting technical here. Yeah, let's not get technical, but why Why would we not say like, okay, why is it 10 people? Are we talking 10 people? Are we talking, like, what are you talking when we're saying these studies that really inform our practice? Yeah. OCD is a very heterogeneous, you know, pro disorder problem. People have washing, checking, you know, all these different things. I've worked with probably, you know, over a thousand people with OCD in my life. And like, I, there are no two people that have exactly the same types of obsessions and compulsions. So if we're going to say a treatment works, we can't just base that on like 10 people, right? We need large samples. We're talking 50, 60 or more to be in these studies so that when we get the averages from everybody, we're taking all of the variability, the heterogeneity of OCD into account. And you mentioned the power analysis. That is a, a analysis that researchers do before the study to get an idea of how many people should be in their study. They're not just kind of saying, oh, I'll, I'll have 30, I'll have 80. They do careful calculations to determine how many people they're gonna include in the study first. And here's what I want us to talk about for a second. So sample size is important, right? Because we know that there's biases, there's things that come into play, right? A lot of stuff. Dr. Brown once talked about the Y box. Let's back up a second and describe what that is. So the Y box is a quick measure. So this is a form that a lot of you may or may not have seen. If not, you can find it on iocdf.org. But it's a quick measure that really helps us understand um, both obsessions and compulsions that someone with OCD is living with and the severity of their symptoms. So the Y box produces a score after you complete it, whether using Y box one or two, and puts you into severity rankings. And what we would hope is that with appropriate treatment, if you start at a severe level, right, that with good treatment, your OCD symptoms will decrease and you will get to a mild, moderate subclinical, you know, but a much lower level. Yeah. So can you talk for a second, John, about 
why, what it means when we're actually looking for a statistically significant difference in outcome. So what would make you say, oh, ERP is successful? Is it just that my YBOX score went down a little bit? Is it that everyone's score went down? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, a statistically significant difference means that there is a only a tiny probability that the difference between groups is due to chance. And um, wow, we could spend like a whole another very boring, put people to sleep, a very boring webinar. You and Kyle on, can do that. On what, <laughs> exactly. On your research yeah. roundtable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We, we routinely put people to sleep. Um, I'm kidding. No, no, I'm, I'm, kidding. I'm, I'm joking around. But yeah, but we, again, statisticians, like they, all this scientific stuff has been worked out over like a couple hundred years, like all the statistical stuff that you need to do to make sure that those results are not just a fluke. Um, and we also need to replicate them. So it's one thing to have one study, two studies. In order to say that a treatment is really evidence-based, we need to see a mountain of evidence from studies all in different labs, in different countries, with different populations of people with OCD. So Americans, people from the Middle East, people from Africa, that's what really helps to provide the evidence. The other thing is that um, we need to see data from independent labs and from unbiased labs. So if I invent, I didn't invent ERP, I studied it because uh, really, because that's what I was fascinated by and my advisor was studying. So I learned a lot about it and wanted to improve upon it, but I didn't invent it. I have nothing to gain, whether it's, whether it works or doesn't work. Um, and some of the studies that I've done have, the results have come out counter to what I, to what I thought. But what we want to see is studies that are done by people who don't have a horse in the race. If I have a horse in the race and I want a certain treatment to work because I invented it or whatever, then you can't trust the outcome of that as much as you could a study where I am completely unbiased. Um, and that's, that's an issue in, in science because most of the time we study things that we have a vested interest in. That's right. So we, 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 it just means we need to, it doesn't mean that those studies don't mean anything. What it means that we need to take that into consideration when we're thinking about the, the status of an evidence-based treatment hasn't been shown to work by, you know, Chance. In, independent investigators all over the place and not just one or two labs that like, I love this treatment. I'm going to do a study and show that it works. That's right. not good science. Right. And when I said chance, I mean, we're, we want to make sure, right, that it isn't just because of chance. And I was just right. thinking about that earlier when you said, oh, yeah, one might be assigned to talk therapy. I thought, well, what if I was assigned to talk therapy with Chris? I'd probably do better, even if it's just talk <laughs> therapy, because it'd be like, well, I relate to him. And, you know, and so again, it's across the board. Can we remove biases? Can we remove chance yeah. um, and really be able to say this is proven? So let's jump to ERP. So by the way, let me, I just want to recommend. So there's a great book. I teach. Why do I know so much about this? Well, I, I have a PhD, a research degree, but I also teach a class in scientific method and in critical thinking. And one of the textbooks I use, it's very readable. I recommend everybody, everyone should read this book when they're in like high school. It's called How to Think About Weird Things. And it's by Schick, Te Theodore Schick, and I forget Vaughn's first name, Schick and Vaughn, How to Think, maybe Skylar can put that up in the, in the comments, How to Think About Weird Things. I think it's on its like eighth or ninth edition. But I'm just a, happy you didn't recommend an Andy Fields book that I was going to pull <laughs> out and teach people stats. Right. Yeah. No, no, no. This is a very readable book. And there's a chapter that explains all what I'm talking about, um, why science is what it is and, and why we can't just go by an individual's experience. Even if it's lived experience, that's that can be very helpful, but that's not the same as actual scientific data. We, we don't want to confuse those two things. And I know in my thesis, like some of the, the studies also had follow up, like they would go back a year later, or there'd be some longitudinal studies yeah. that showed that ERP wasn't like this thing that only worked briefly, and then it went back. I mean, they still had those gains. So I think that's important too, when studies can do that, to let people know, not only does it work right now, but it works consistently. Yeah, that's right. So let's jump into OCD. So how can you tell me a little bit about when did we know that ERP was when did ERP become coined as the gold standard treatment? I actually think that's one of your citations that I always use is ERP is the gold standard of Bramowitz. It might be, I can't remember what year, is that 20, 
2006 or when it is, but what, what do you think? So how can you describe of like, when did we know, okay, ERP is kind of the best treatment to date. And can we still say that? Yeah. So this accumulated over the years. The first studies were done in the 50s and 60s. There were some case reports. Then there was a study in 1966 where they had, you know, a group of uh, people that went through treatment. And at that point, behavioral therapy was kind of on the outs. The, everyone was doing psychoanalysis and dynamic therapy. And folks were like, oh, you behaviorists, you're not really diving into the deep ego and id and the personality. You're just doing very uh, superficial stuff. Over the next 20, 30 years or so, more studies were done. People, psychotherapy researchers were challenged to, you know, explore the evidence for this. So they did these different types of studies. And in the past 50 years, uh, a mountain of randomized controlled studies have been done looking at exposure and response prevention for OCD around the world by people who didn't invent the treatment, by people who don't have a horse in the race, but are scientists and want to, you know, learn information and put that out there. And so over time, we've accumulated this, this evidence based. And absolutely, I mean, there is no other evidence base as strong um, as there is for ERP for, for OCD. There is no question about it. Don't take my word for it. You can go to Google Scholar and you can put in ER, you know, exposure and response prevention for OCD, randomized controlled study, you know, controlled trial you will get you know, hundreds if not thousands of, of, of studies that are coming up. Um, and, and we understand why, so it's not just I dreamed up this therapy and, and so it should work because I think it does. ERP, the reason that the first folks did it in the 50s and the 60s, they were drawing on behavioral theory that had been worked out since the time of Pavlov and Watson and Skinner back in the early part of the you know, 1900s. Um, so it's a treatment not only that works, but we understand why it works. We have good, clear mechanisms. Um, so it is absolutely the, the gold standard. That doesn't mean it works for everybody. That doesn't mean that there aren't other treatments that can be helpful. There are, we're learning about them, but ERP is still the gold standard. There's no question about it. So I love a comment I'm gonna hop to. Um, thanks for, they, they plugged John and I, which I appreciate, but, but the comment I love is, I want to add that ERP itself is not necessarily a one size fits all approach. That is ERP might look different for different patients, but the common denominator is that it's still the gold standard treatment, but of course treatment can evolve over time. And as we learn more, and I love that because I think sometimes what we hear is that, okay, ERP is just this, like, it's this one way and that's it. And if it doesn't work, then I've failed treatment and now I can't get help. And I that's like, right. I want to jump to that next, which is that what do you do if you're going to someone who says they do ERP and Chris, I'm going to let you take this, but like you go to someone who says they, they do ERP and you're not getting better. Does that mean ERP doesn't work for you? And what should be your next steps? If we know we're kind of saying ERP should be the first behavioral intervention you do for OCD treatment. I think we, we all, we, we can agree. The research tells us that. What would you do next, Chris? Yeah. So exposure response prevention, I would say even since I did it to where it is now as it's evolved, it doesn't mean it's completely changed and we can't recognize it. The same concept is still there. But I know obviously like when I did treatment, it was much more habituation model. And now when I teach it, it's a lot more the inhibitory learning model that I, you know, that I, I read your work in, in college. Um, we still wear pants and shirts. We've been for hundreds of years, but they look, they look different now <laughs> than when than they great. did a hundred years exactly. ago. I love that analogy. That's awesome. That's yeah. I just thought of it actually. Yeah. Wow, so, so there's a couple different things, you I'm know, steal with, that. I'm gonna use that. with exposure Good. response prevention, there's a treatment called, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. Oh, you're here. The, 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 now the, the, um, letters act a lot and it really kind of pulls on, allowing the thoughts to be there and making a commitment to really live into the value. So for instance, if my friend is throwing a birthday party, but they have a dog and my OCD is around animal born illnesses, I would still choose to go because that's important to me. And I want to be there for my friend. And that's a value of mine. And I know I will be triggered when I'm there, but I'm still going to commit to going and then use the ERP when I'm there. 
I think uh, other things that are important as well is like, you know, instead of just tossing out ERP, sometimes people need to have medication management. So medication might be an option. Sometimes people need a higher level of care. So often I refer people to programs like Liz because maybe somebody needs that consistent daily care. Sometimes people need a support group. There could be family accommodation that's getting in the way. Sometimes there's a motivation um, issue. So we go to motivational interviewing for OCD. There's a good uh, government research study. So the ERP can have adjuncts that can help. Sometimes you need to slow ERP down. Sometimes people need a little bit more psychoeducation. Um, and sometimes the ways that maybe it was done 20 years ago has evolved to be a more, I, I saw in the chat, like somebody said, can it be a more softer treatment? Cause our therapist was really harsh when they did ERP. Absolutely. It can yeah. be done by a, a little bit softer way. So I'm always nervous when somebody's kind of just tossing out ERP cause it didn't work or they'll say like, I tried it. I think there's people with good intention that went and got trainings for ERP, but they might only see five or six OCD clients a year. And they're not using it. They're not going to conferences and staying up to date on it. So that would be another question. If you're severe, asking your clinician, like, are you going to trainings? Are you getting updates? Are you on the kind of latest cutting edge of research in how you use it in practice? And the no. other piece I want to make sure we talk about, and John, maybe you can jump into this too. I know you have another yeah. comment is yeah. what about therapeutic rapport, right? What about like, you both are great ERP clinicians, but there's a chance I go to you, Chris, and like, we just don't click. And, and does, should I just, does that mean ERP doesn't work for me? Or should I try going to you, John, and giving it another chance? Chris, are you going to say something? Would I just add to that is, I mean, that's why I like working at a group practice. Sometimes people's OCD is around very personal themes and would prefer a female. Sometimes somebody like really just relates to a client, sometimes age. I mean, I was working with a uh, you know, a client in their 80s. And we had a clinician at the time that was older than me. And just the client didn't want to hear from me. <laughs> they just thought I was too young. So things like that, that therapeutic rapport, the therapeutic alliance is key as well. Key. And, and it gets short shrift in the descriptions of the treatment, right? It's like, you got to face your fear and not do rituals. But wait a minute, that's, that's the a description, a brief description of the technique. In order to coach someone and help them to challenge them to face their fears, you better have a good relationship with that with that person. Imagine taking like piano lessons and having a terrible relationship with your piano teacher. You're not gonna follow directions. You're not. You're gonna. You know, it's it's not gonna work out. And similarly with a therapist, you've got to have that good working relationship where you understand each other. So, and I, like Chris is saying, so important. And sometimes it doesn't click and you, you want to find someone else. And uh, yeah, sometimes you have people that, you know, whatever, they want a, a certain gender of a therapist or, you know, a certain maybe race. Great, let's find that person. But that doesn't mean that we, that the technique ultimately doesn't work. That's right. there's, there's the science and then there's also art. That's of, right. Of doing the therapy. That's right. I and I want you to think about your favorite teachers right? Your favorite teacher was not every single person in that classroom's favorite teacher, right? right? Because you learn different and you absorb different and you interact differently, right? Um, I can think about even, I was raised by the same parents as my siblings and we're all very different, right? And we all, we all, you know, still connect very differently with one another and that's okay. So it's important to say too, you know, one of the things Dr. Goodman taught me and, and we can, this is a whole nother day, a whole nother story. If we, we go into DBS and different things is that even something like DBS, which is one of the most, you know, highest level interventions for OCD, deep brain stimulation, it is never a last resort. And so when we think about treatment, it's important to recognize that no one is saying one size fits all, because guess what? Let's go back to what we were talking about early on, which is that people have different diagnoses. People have different presenting issues. People have different things going on in their life. And we are going to click and, 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 and ERP is going to look different for all of us. And so it's really critical, important that we don't just say, oh, I went to, ER I went to an ERP therapist that didn't work. Therefore, ERP doesn't work for me. Right. Not necessarily true. That would um, be I, using just kind of anecdotal personal experience, right? Right. Right. And so the I know I had a million other things to get through, and we have two minutes, so we won't. Um, I think, John, if we can steal more of your time in the near future, we'd love to do a part two, because I think that to. would be great for us to really start to dive into, okay, so what do we do next yeah. if the gold standard treatment isn't working? Right. But today what I love is that we got to focus on 
how do we get to a point where we label something gold standard? And what I want you, everyone to hear and to walk away with is that it isn't just based on what John, Chris, and I think works with our patients. Um, and in fact, while that might be important information for us to share, that isn't science. And that isn't something that ethically we should then be sharing with the public, right? What we should be sharing and encouraging the public to utilize is something that's backed in years and in multitude of studies, research, science, and rigor. And that really that's how we should get to a point where we're labeling treatments as being the first line and what you should try first. Now remember, often the most effective is a combination of medication and behavioral therapy. And ERP is the first line behavioral therapy approach that people should be trying for OCD. Um, but I, I'm just so excited and I think this has been, it's been helpful for me. I hope it's been helpful for everybody listening, but for us to just kind of get to how did we get to where we're at with ERP and how do you choose, um, first, how do you choose a clinician? Our part two is going to be, how do you start to understand if they've had the right training? Because I've seen a lot of comments on somebody went to BTTI, but they might not be super qualified, but like, what does training actually look like? And what could we start, what, what, what would make us say, okay, this person has a level of training that makes sense. Also, I want us to talk about how do we choose what level of treatment? Yeah. Right. And if ERP is not working, maybe I need more intensive ERP. Um, maybe I need ERP and something else. And how do I start to understand that? And then, of course, we want to talk a lot about what is the role that um, adjunctive treatments play? So ACT, DBT, um, all these different interventions that we hear and that can be really useful for folks. When and where do they play a role? So I'm excited for part two. Let's um, wrap up. Uh, Chris, we'll let you have the first words in wrapping up, and then John will move over to you. And thank you all both so much. My pleasure. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the, the two quick things I want to say is just like, I'm really, really glad that IOCF is around because I know that I tried a lot of different treatments. I had somebody try tapping. I had somebody try thought stopping, talk therapy, traditional kind of cognitive behavioral therapy, and it wasn't helpful. So I'm really glad there's people like John that are consistently doing the treatment behind the scenes. And I just want to thank the IOCF. And I want to remind everybody out there what the IOCF does. They are an incredible nonprofit that provides resources to researchers so they can continue to do um, evidence-based research. They provide uh, people with a therapist directory at iocf.org forward slash find dash help. They provide a conference each year, a virtual conference, multiple conferences. So they're really a place for support, for education, for resources. They're not a treatment center that can diagnose and assess, but they can definitely direct you to someone who can. So I just want to shout the IOCF out. Yeah. John. You know, I think this is a great conversation to have. Um, folks with OCD are, are really smart, is, is my um, it's been my experience. And I agree hundred percent. I will not argue. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys, and, and they are awesome consumers of, you know, information. And like, that's been my experience since I got into the field in the 1990s. Um, and so it's just, it's really important to continue to help folks to understand, like you're saying, not just what are the treatments that, that are helpful, but why, how to get, you know, how to find the right provider. I just think this is so, now that we have a treatment and, and several treatments, and there are other up and coming treatments we talked about, ACT, there are other treatments that probably we, we should continue to, to study. And one day maybe they'll have the evidence base that ERP has, but we need to keep folks um, aware of these developments in the field. I think it's really important. So kudos to you all. And a couple takeaways. Number one, I want as a consumer, please learn the why and never be afraid to ask why that is yeah. critical. It's important. I always talk about this. I have two babies now. And, um, you know, when, when I put my little infant on bed on the bed and everyone says back is best, I might think, okay, well, whatever I, a doctor says back is best. I guess I'll put them on their back. But if I understand the why yeah. and the risk of SIDS and why I'm doing it, I don't ever question where, whether I'm going to put the, you know, put her on her back because I know the why. So ask the why it's important and know it. Number two, treatment should evolve, right? I, we're hearing some stories and people are talking about treatment where, you know, my therapist made me hold a, ni hold a knife to her neck day one. That's not what not we good. do. No. That's not what we should be doing. And so, but I don't want us to think if I had one bad experience, all ERP will be a bad experience. So let us keep talking about how and what ERP should actually look like. And again, we know ERP has the most evidence. And so we definitely want you to start there, but we also 
want you to ask the why and to make sure the treatment is what's right for you because each person's treatment, even if we're doing ERP, should be individualized and should be specific for your diagnosis and for your symptoms. Thank y'all for joining. Amazing live stream. Excited for part two. Talk soon. Bye. Thanks. And all the questions we'll put, we'll save for another day. <laughs>